we are young adults and we're trying to find ourselves. And as we're trying to find ourselves, it's very easy to get very lost, right? But I, I have a sense that that was always within you to deeply care for people who yeah. need help. Hey, welcome to Spiritually Hungry. We're so excited to introduce our guest today, Michael Capone, a leader in the world of humanitarian relief efforts. He started his career as a force in the nightclub in a real estate industries in South Florida. Welcome to the show, Michael. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes, uh, we were just talking before that we met, I think, for the first time 12 years ago. Um, and we we're very inspired by the work that you do. And one of the ideas that I often think about, you know, as you, you know, we, we, we teach spirituality and we try to inspire people both to better their lives and to better our world. And one of the overarching themes is that if you influence just one person, you've influenced an entire world. And it's always, I find it even more inspiring, more than just the story of one person's life, which is, as we said, a whole world that has been bettered by uh, spiritual teachings that, that that we can impart. When one person then takes that and then brings, we'll call it goodness or positivity, or in this way, very practical help to millions and millions more. So that's the reason that, that I'm so excited to be able to, to speak with you today and to share with our listeners uh, some of the work that you're doing in the world, but maybe we start in the beginning. Yeah, I'm always curious about when you meet people who are doing great things in the world, their story and how they kind of ended up where they are in that regard, because usually it's somewhere very far from it. Usually we have our own experience of pain um, and then an awakening. So you started in the nightclub industry right your father was in that yeah business? Father was in that i grew up in that you followed your father's footsteps in the nightlife industry in miami beach specifically yeah, yeah so in the while i was still in high school i started passing out flyers for you know the, some of the first parties that ever happened in you know the late 80s and um that turned into being uh like I said, the helm of nightlife, you know, at a very young age with a lot of excess and and a lot of drugs and a lot of women and all the those things that it comes with. Uh, by the time I was 22, I was extremely successful, Mercedes boat, you know, big giant apartment and everything. Do you and have my, siblings, by the way? No. So it's just you and were your parents supportive of your lifestyle? I was out of the house. You were? Yeah, by the time I was 16, oh, I was wow. already you know, living on my own. And I got addicted to drugs, specifically heroin. And it took me about a year of a heroin addiction to go from basically having to hand back, like we learn in Kabbalah, right? God gives and takes away pretty much everything I had ever earned for myself, right? Because it wasn't earned with the right seed or intention, right? From what I was selling, right? In the nightlife and, and so, all of that. So I 22, up, you were at a high and then it took one year to kind of... Yeah, no, I think by 22, it was crashing. Already... I spent the blizzard of 1995 from Halloween to New Year's, completely homeless here in New York City, begging, trading those little tokens that you had for the subways literally to survive. Oh, wow. I like, think, can we go in more into detail of that of that story? So again, just the timeline. So from the age of, is it 16 till? 16 to 21, let's so call it's it. It's all, it's all, let's call it the Jim Morrison <laughs> wild, you know. And you thought you were having a great time. You thought yeah. you, you were living your best life. Yeah. Um, but obviously not very spiritual, but clearly very much into what we would call the physicality. Um, and then you get addicted, right? So heroin, and then that starts when? At about age 20. 20. Yeah. And then- You didn't have any fear around that drug specifically? I mean, that's one of the heaviest, most seriously addictive. I think, yeah, at the time we were just, you know, every, drugs were in at that time, you know, it was like the, the early 90s in the nightlife world was, mm -hmm. you know, a resurgence of, you know, the ecstasies and, and all of that. So, yeah, so that, time in the street which is you know substantial in my kabbalah right learnings that we'll talk about after um you know 
that was literally begging and trading, right? And basically you wake up every single day from sleeping on either a subway or you're in some, you know, crash uh, little motel that you scrounged up $50 for. Well, why did you come to New York though for Miami? I like blew all my bridges in Miami. And I had like a friend that like took me in and then it didn't go well because of the addiction. And then I think got kicked out and then I, it's just a mm. whole series of things. I made it out. Um, I but I'm sorry, I was, I was really interested in that period. So, are, are you con are you thinking when you wake up in the morning, like, oh my God, what did I do to my life? Or, or no, you just you're so into the addiction? Another hit of whatever. That you you're not even beginning awareness. I think when you're that entrapped, all you think about is death. Like I probably tried and attempted to kill myself, you know, literally like a hundred times. I mean, it was, you know, yeah, you're, you're, there, there's no way out. Your addiction, I had an 800 hour day heroin addiction. You can imagine you know, how difficult uh, it is. You have to basically wake up and find that, right? You can't operate or live without it. Once, you know, it's, it, it, it's like swaps on you. So all day you're trying to find that and get that high. Where were your parents at this time? I think I was pretty much, I was in a little bit of contact with my mom. My father was already passed on. So it was a tough period. Um, I got out, then I went to Europe, got on methadone. And um, I thought I was cured just like that because it was like a transfer, right? It's like taking, you know, heroin, which is you know an opiate to a synthetic, but it's really the same thing. And... Uh, it's only when we started weaning me off of the methadone that the pain really started you know, being very, very difficult. So then I had to uh, start drinking to compensate for it. So then I became like a you know, bottle or two of absolute vodka or whatever it was a day just to not shake as you were withdrawing, it was. That, I'm assuming that's not doctor recommended. Well, yeah, who is <laughs> yeah. super? So you had okay. How did you get to Europe then? You're from New York. Your your mom yeah. or yeah my mom and um, oh actually you know what I, I got the timelines wrong my my father was still when I was in the street so he I went and stayed with him in Belgium actually I see and then he put me on methadone with Belgium doctors and then it's only uh, after that that I fell in a coma and then apparently I woke up like I think two days later. And then I had a giant meningioma brain tumor in my right ear. That's why I can't hear from my right ear. And um, they basically told my father. So, that, the, sorry, the coma was from the, the tumor, tumor. Yeah. Which was unrelated yeah. to your lifestyle. It's just something that. It could have been related. We, 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 don't, we don't know. But they told my father at the time uh, when I woke up from the coma that there was no way they can operate on me that, you know, with all the circumstances and X, Y, and my like life expectancy was like a week. Then my mom came, you know, argued with the doctors. I ended up having about 60 hours of brain surgery over three different operations. They finally got the tumor out and then I got meningitis. And then that was like, you know, on IV antibiotics for like another two, three months that wow. like, killed all of my white blood cells. So that was like basically having HIV almost like, you know, with your, your strength. I remember not even having like one pound weights and being able to, you know, hold them in, 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 in rehab. And then after that, that was, they transferred me from methadone to morphine. Then I had to get off the morphine and go back on methadone and then get back off the methadone after that. Moral of the story is uh, when I finally got off the methadone after that, I was which in. Which is a, even after the surgeries. Yeah, yeah. So, what? The this surgeries, is like what, six months? Let's call it, yes, mm -hmm. something like six months. I did that in Canada, in Montreal. And then they told me, you know, you're going to have to change all your friends. You're never going to be able to be in Miami again. You're never going to be able to be in nightlife again. Uh, you're going to have to go to a meeting, or, you know, a therapy meeting, you know. Yeah, every single day for the rest of your life, mm -hmm. if not two meetings, you know, 98%, you know, of all heroin addicts will relapse and come back. I mean. And I laughed at, at them and I actually left that rehab center and I got called AWOL. I had to like sign AWOL papers. I left. To this day, I have never once touched a, a, a recreational drug ever again. Uh, ever so i got the memo right so, so yeah i was gonna ask how did you how what do you attribute the strength that how what age at this is this now you're still young this yeah is like, so this is 90 this is 96 now right because those streets in, in, in 95 so 26 yeah 26 yeah. so so what to what do you attribute because you weren't deeply spiritual at that time 
what in you... search, deeply searching. I think I was always deeply searching, right? And um, I always, at that time, I think that it was just a, kind of a karmic, uh, you know, consequential thing that that happened to me. And uh, I think the universe really supported me in my comeback. I mean, I, I made it straight back to- So you, you went know, back to Miami? I went back to Miami and, you know, I was almost right back in my same position um, you know, fairly quickly. I read a story. Um, it was an, you were interviewed for a magazine and you told a story of how you had befriended an unhoused person. And, um, three weeks after that you had met him on the street and this is when you were like a teenager mm -hmm. and three weeks later, he, you invited him to live with you. So my sense and inclination is that you always had this kind of, humanitarian streak and and really a desire to help others and then often we lose ourselves when we go we are young adults and we're trying to find ourselves and as we're trying to find ourselves it's very easy to get very lost right but i i have a sense that that was always within you to deeply care for people who yeah. need help yeah it was it's accurate my first apartment i i invited a homeless person to live with me <laughs> my roommate when i was young and you know, like we learn in in, in the center, um, right? Too much of a in the garden of earthly delights, right? Tasting it all, it's all in front of you, right? Miami Beach and women and all this stuff, right? And I devoured it, right? So it's like Adam and even I didn't eat one apple; I ate a hundred, right? So it crashed and burned. Um, when I came back, um, you know, I was. I didn't do drugs anymore, but I was still a lot more in the ego. Every company I built in Miami was called, you know, Capone Construction Group, Capone Casa. I was, you know, I was going in a, you know, Trump ego still direction again. You know, I lived in a $8 million house and I used to stand on my roof and people would say, your house is nice. And I was like, yeah, next month I'm buying the one next door. I'm going to bulldoze it and make it a tennis court. This is like my my consciousness at the at the time. When the Haiti earthquake happened, um, I was, you know, building really big homes in, in, in Miami Beach, some $30 million homes and things like that, doing fairly well. I still had, uh, you know, a big stake in, in nightlife. And I would be in Haiti where there was literally doctors that I would bring sawing arms and legs without anesthesia off people because of the, you know, situation that had gotten, right? The maggots and all the very hard things, right? That, that will strike you for life. Um, and I would see all that and then you know, I'd be in Haiti for 10 days and then I would come back and I would literally get out of my humanitarian outfit, take a shower and then go back to Miami beach and be in a nightclub. And I would watch basically, uh, you know, uh, my nightclub, for example, or the nightclub through the uh, completely different eyes, right? Everyone's on the banquettes. They're like dancing. They're like, woo. And I was like, wow, if only these people were with me in Haiti, maybe they would, you know, kind of understand it. And then while I was there, I was like, what am I doing here? I should be back over there. So then I left back over there. And eventually I didn't pay as much attention to my construction business and nightlife business because I was more what into- year, What year is this start? This is uh, 2010, right? I was more into, you know, going back to Haiti all the time. I mean, I think the first year of Haiti, I went back like 30, 40 times. Oh. I've been to Haiti 102 times since now, you know? And Again, like we always say, all all by divine order. And that I think that was the first like chapter of really, you know, true like change, right? And then there was these weird issues that started arising in my uh, construction companies. Something silly as someone falls off a ladder and wants to sue me for $1.2 million, mm -hmm. but I only made half a million dollars last year. So now I got to work two years to pay the, you know, and it was, it was almost like I was, I felt like a little bit in the streets again, like you're, you're, you're on this like gerbil treadmill. Right. And I was like, this is going nowhere. Right. I'm like working just to like basically survive and, and pay out of debt. Oh, kept telling me, you know, 
are you sure this is what you want to do, Michael, in your life? She's like, I think that you're meant to do some much more important things than just build big mansions in Miami and, and stuff. And, you know, I would write her off. I was like, yeah. And then, you know, I, I never speak about this publicly, but since you're probably the most, you know, person that's had the most profound influence on me with you and your father, um, which I've taken those lessons very carefully, as those things were going bad for me and I didn't understand them, um, I started doing, let's call it, you know, spiritual shamanic medicine ceremonies, right? I don't <laughs> call them by anything. Um, and in my first one, I uh, not only saw what my purpose was or what I was doing on this planet and all the things that had happened in my life by perfect design. How, you know, Michael, you were meant to, you know, bring out your parents had to be divorced for you to run away, for you to, you know, start doing drugs, for you to be this soul, for you to end up in the street. All of this was to prepare you for what you're going to do. It had to happen this way. It was like revealed to me. And then in the first ceremony, I saw probably like an hour's worth of Hebrew letters that I didn't really? understand wow. that just came to And me you weren't like, studying Kabbalah at the time? Nothing, just, wow. nothing. But you knew that they were Hebrew letters. You could tell the shapes and... Oh, we no, no, it was clear as day. And and I had been working a little bit with Donna Karen, with, with Haiti, right? And it was, you know, shown to... I remember she was asking me, do you study Kabbalah? I was like, what's that, you know? Um, I didn't know much about it. And it was very like direct powerful message uh you must uh start studying this and learn it so that's when i went to the kabbalah center you mean just basically just like signed up and took <laughs> kabbalah one and then kabbalah two and then worked with uh yehuda and then as i was doing these this work in the ceremony let's call it uh you know the cleaning of the soul, right? There, there was just so much to, you know, review and, and, and understand. As I was learning it uh, and reading the Zohar and learning about, you know, what you teach at the center, it was almost explained to me. I remember Yehuda used to tell me, you're one of my best students, but you're, you didn't go to Hebrew school. You're not even <laughs> Jewish. He's like, how do you understand these things, you know? And it's it's almost like I got, you know, a sneak peek sometimes and, you know, the different things. Like I can honestly, you know, like I feel I've been into in this conscious state of Bina and I've been in, shown those things, right? And it really prepared me to basically, you know, surrender, which was, you know, the biggest decision of my life. And I fought it, I think from 2011 to probably 2018. Well, seven years. To, I wanted to have my cake and eat it too, basically. And Which my, means continue business in Miami. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm going to be a big then... business guy. I'm going to have a charity and, you know, I'll do them both equally. And I can do yeah, it all. Yeah, and, I, yeah. you know, that, that was that. And, and, and the universe would show me, you want to be like Apple or you want to be like Steve Jobs, you need to be fully focused on one thing. You have no room in your life to be building homes or do anything. You must let it all go. I wouldn't let it go. Then what's interesting, and this is why, you know, again, these are- Which part of it did you, it's not so much that you even enjoyed it, but it was kind of the power or the, the lifestyle it provided. And also the money, I right. think. Also, you know, also, also the money. So then I got out of nightlife, but then I started doing these beach clubs and I started opening up various beach clubs in Puerto Rico and Miami and Bimini and all that. And I thought, you know, I'm going to have these bunch of beach clubs and it's, you know, a completely different shift. It's still not nightlife. But when I had them, I looked at them and it was the exact same thing. It was just daytime, you know, nonsense ultimately. But then a hurricane came. It literally like took all these beach clubs out, all of it. And I was stripped again That's with like nothing, no like real serious, you know, career direction anymore. I was like, what do I do? I'm like such a good builder. And then, you know, I have all these people skills and everything. And, you know, and again, I would do these ceremonies and ceremonies would say, when you surrender and you let it all go, you will see that, you know, your only thing that you will do in your life is to help people. You need to put all of everything into that. 
So the message was clear for seven years, right? So you heard it. Yeah, I heard it for seven years. And, it, and it's not until the blockages came, right? Thank you. Right? We always right, say the curses, right? right? Are, are the gifts, things, right? Yeah. The curses are the blessings, right? Why would you do this to me, God? I helped so many kids in 80. Now I have no businesses. I was like all pissed off. Oh, there was anger. But yeah, there was anger. It was, you know, and then I, I, you have like almost debt happening. You have all these things that are that are happening, but it's for your own good, right? And when, you know, I finally decided to just officially announce and put, you know, change on Wikipedia and everything that, you know, I am not no longer in the private sector and I am dedicating my whole life to the foundation work. The foundation grew in, it's really interesting because I could prove what I'm saying by actual tax returns. And I was shown in a ceremony in 2017, what I'd be doing today. I like, I actually saw it mm. and I saw all the disasters coming and how it'd be assisting. You but did it, it down to the detail of like location and how are you just kind no, of No, like almost like, like an a, overview movie mm -hmm. of like everything that's happening, just things erupting and boiling and wars and, you know, earthquakes and, and all of that. And in 2016, GEMS tax return, Jeb, um, sorry, before our listeners, yeah, our foundation, it's, it's, Global it's, it's, Power and Mission, right. was uh, $65,000. That's what we raised for the whole year, right? I didn't take a salary, anything. When I surrendered, it was 2017, sorry. When I surrendered in 2017, when I was shown previous what would happen, we were able to have a $17 million tax return. Today, in 2024 now, just the 2023 tax return, is 164 million now, right? So there is no other explanation, right? Other than spirit. Foundations don't just grow like mm -hmm. that, right? That is the entire universe and all the angels that are, right? Like, right? And removing the clipo and basically channeling and saying, we support you, you do this, right? And I am like in service. That's all I do. I wake up every single morning. I read the Zohar for 30 minutes, I do my daily prayers, and then I get into action. And that's like all I do. And I float from one space to another space to another space. And why I today think God gave me this job is because I was in the streets and because of all that. I actually can go into a disaster, meet with someone that's been the most horrible things you can ever imagine, right? Raped by Russian soldiers, beaten, all of that. And I can relate to them and I can tell them my story. And I can tell them that even if you gave me $10 billion today and asked me to erase those things that we mm -hmm. talked about in the beginning, there's not a, I wouldn't even consider it. Mm -hmm. Like there's no chance. There's nothing. That's a beautiful the point. The wisdom yes. acquired from the negative hell that I went through mm -hmm. is the greatest gift mm -hmm. of all. Mm -hmm. It's the foundational work of everything, right? That's really it's so beautiful. inspiring. Yeah. What I, I also find interesting is that in all of the um, emotions or adjectives you've used to describe your experiences, you had anger, you had hopelessness, you had surrender. But fear, it doesn't seem like you're a fear-based person because even just to do ceremonial medicine and have those experiences for somebody who has your history, most people will be afraid to go down that no. path for not for the unknown, fear of the unknown of where it could lead or to leave your financial security, even though you knew your soul has now refound you know, this ancient wisdom because it's clear that you've been here before with this. Um, most would not, they, they'd say, okay, I'll do less of it, but I'm still going to hold on to something, right? Because I, I, the unknown is scary. So I find that really inspiring also about you and kind of fascinating because fear usually is along for the ride for most of these things. Yeah. Yeah. I remember my teachers at the center would tell me it was uh, Shimon Fadi, right? He would say, you know, when you die, you know, what are you going to tell the creator huh, that you did? Huh? What are you going to tell them? You built a bunch of uh, big buildings and houses and you put your kids in, in uh, Harvard. You think this is what he wants to hear? Ah, you come straight back down. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, he said, what, what purpose are you going to give your life? And when I, you know, when all those things eventually, you know, really clicked. 
then I was like, I don't care anymore. I just only want to like live to please God. End of story. I don't really care. It doesn't really matter. And yeah. And to Monica's point, have you felt fear throughout this journey? I mean, the, the, because there are times, and some which we'll hopefully speak about as well, risks. Where That's yeah, risks. where one one would imagine that fear would have been a natural emotion. I mean, even to start a nonprofit. I mean, all of the things really that we've talked about. Yeah, I think I was more scared from an ego perspective. You know, what are people going to think of my if, if I have to sell my house and I live in a you know three bedroom apartment all of a sudden <laughs> and this and you know and, and then eventually I just I could care less anymore. You know, and um, physical fear doesn't exist in me. My dad swam the English Channel, probably why you know spirit chose that I'd be incarnated into those genes. So he swam the English Channel a few times. He swam really? straits, Bosphorus you know, at night with sharks, you know, wow. for two, three days. Um, I'm on the front lines of Ukraine, um, probably, you know, the very least once every 30, 45 days for a few days wow. with, you know, sometimes an explosion going off every minute, sometimes three a minute. I've, like I told you, I've, you know, been walked the streets of Gaza by myself at night. Um, I feel protected. I'm also not stupid. I would walk, you know, obviously into a line of fire, but you know, I hear messages, go, don't go. Uh, we responded to a, a hurricane Willa once in uh, Mexico, and it was, it happened to be in the, in Sinaloa, where, you know, the El Hotels, Chapo yeah. <laughs> wars and all that were there. And uh, I remember the, the Mexican teams I was with were like, you cannot go there. If you go in there, you get shot in five minutes. Impossible. Gringo in Sinaloa, you crazy. I was like, meditated. I tuned in and I heard Spirit go, go. And then we went in right after hurricane. That was like seamless. We That's brought so trucks cool. of aid. We helped the children. So I call it like, if you have enough positive energy, right? You can clear the, the, the field, right? Of the clipo and the negative just by your own presence, right? I was just recently in Israel and, uh, you know, I was um, at the West Wall and then I wanted to go to uh, the, the, the rock, the dome, the right? Rock. And um, the IDF soldiers, you know, basically told me, you, you can't go there, it's way too dangerous. You know, there's there's no way they're gonna stab you. Do not go, please. And uh, my Jewish friends, you know, stayed back and, and I walked over there and, and I walked around and I gave everybody big smiles and everyone was like, welcome, welcome. And, you know, and it was beautiful. So I, I always tell people, you you put yourself more in danger if you fear. And it's like, you know, there's some people that could swim with sharks. If you see a shark and you're like, ah, he might bite you. If you face it and give it, you know, strength and positive things, right? Which I have swam with sharks. It's, it's uh So it's like you have an invisible army with you that you feel and see, but it's it's you and, and all of that support. It reminds me, we were just in Vermont few days ago and as we went for a hike we kind of turned to each other so we saw droppings and i was like that doesn't look like something i've seen like i don't recognize that maybe it's a deer or that we look at each other we're like hmm, maybe they're bears here <laughs> so i started thinking actually didn't share with you that if we ran into a bear i know there's like different things to do depending on the kind of bear it is but of course i wasn't recalling that information in the moment but i was thinking like if if we see a bear i'm just going to command it to respect us. Like, I'm just going to say, no, this is not happening. I don't even, I didn't tell you this, but I had this whole like narrative in my mind of what we would do if we ran into a bear, but I think it's to that but point. It, it is of. to that point. Yeah. It's like in, uh, you know, it's it's a film, but you know, it's also you know pretty accurate in my view, like in, in the scenes in Avatar with the animals, right? So um, yeah. eventually he learned to harness, right? The, the strength, right? And of yeah. those animals and do that. And, um, have you been in what other people might consider life-threatening situations? Yeah, I think I'm in probably, you know, some of the most dangerous positions that any human can be in, no matter what, it could be anything, right? From, you know, I try to be in every disaster that's pretty significant within 24, 48 hours, right? So you go, you show up in a Turkey earthquake, for example, there's still giant tremors that are happening. Another building can, you know, fall on you. And there's volcanoes that are, you know, constantly, um, going off, um, like I said, war zones and stuff. Um, anything can happen, right. but but anything it, can always happen. And anything can it can always happen. You have to, you know, 
understand your time on this earth. I'm not sure the universe would put that much effort into molding me, training me, making me go through all these things in life to like form me and show me what's gonna happen and in these next times that are coming and to make me that kind of soldier so I can just get killed before it all kind of like really so you trust down. that timeline, whatever I, it looks like. Yeah, I don't think, uh, I, I don't feel in any way. Like I feel I've seen like me, you know, in 20 years still unfortunately doing this. I think the world is gonna go through a lot of, you know, very difficult passages still before it gets to the other side. It's not all over tomorrow, as you know. Right. Do you feel, because you mentioned um, your father passing and you were quite young when he passed still. Oh. Do you feel like he supports you kind of from up above? And do you have, um, how do you feel about that relationship? Because you were going through a lot of, I guess, chaos for lack of a better word at that time. And then he died shortly after you. So kind of yeah, it's, it's, it, it's a pretty severe thing. When I woke up from the coma and the doctors told my father who was sitting there that I was not uh, gonna be operable and, and make it. My dad left the hospital, had a stroke. Oh, wow. Then he was in the hospital next door. Then my mom came. She didn't tell me of this. And since I was on morphine, I wasn't even asking about my dad. Mm -hmm. And when I got off the morphine, my mother one day just told me that basically, you know, my dad had died. So, so he left yeah. thinking you it was inoperable. He asked to be unplugged, I guess, from his like multiple strokes that that he had after he was told that I was uh, gonna make it after I after. had my surgeries, yeah. yeah. And I think he reincarnated fairly quickly after. Um, Why so do you say that? Just there's different uh, different ancestors that I can communicate much more freely to that mm -hmm. I feel are still up there. I've, and mm -hmm. I don't feel mm -hmm. that particular mm -hmm. uh, soul as, as well. That's interesting. Yeah. Beautiful. And so I wanted to go, go maybe a little bit more deeply into the work. Yeah. Um, and and so um, I know Haiti was your first major effort, would you say? I mean, I don't know if it was major. I would call it, uh, you know, the getting an MBA in humanitarian work. So what, then, what, year, what year is this? 2010. 2010. What I learned most in Haiti is uh, what not to do. Mm. Uh, the waste of money that goes on in the sector how you know billions were raised for Haiti and there was so much hope and really nothing happened. I learned about overlap. You see nothing? I mean, it's a big but, state, not a lot. Well, the not expectation, a lot. I guess, not a lot. that amount of money. Not a right? lot for, the, for, for, for that uh, amount of money. Why, and, what know, would you attribute that? To? What, what's your assessment now? 20,000 different organizations operating kind of solely independently, doing what you know they think is best, and um, you know, spending a lot of money on imports and you know, flying in big giant teams of people, importing rice, for example, stops rice production in Haiti and so on, right? Mm. So, all the things that we do today, you know, you fast forward today, I, I just came from. Um, you know, I told you that the, we were just at the UN Ukrainian office, for example, and I was, you know, sharing uh, official uh, UN stats on on gem, right? And in, in Ukraine, for example, last year alone, 2023, there's categories, the United Nations, there's a, a category called wash, which is basically like hygiene and, and, and water and things like that. And there's a category called food securities and category called livelihoods. Another category called, uh, you know, repairs. So there's small and medium repairs and large repairs. And this is about efficiency, right? It's about disruption. In 2023, I think with $83 million that we spent on Ukraine programs in, in 2023, we outdid in every single category, we ranked number one. Mm -hmm. Uh, that means on that impact, we, on impact. On impact, yeah. So we distributed more water, more food, repaired more things, right? Than all those UN agencies combined, actually. Because you right? focused just, the, the money went straight to the need. There was not a lot of like fluff or excess or the planes or the people, like yeah. volunteers. It was more about... Yeah. So our main model is empowerment, right? Mm -hmm. So we have different branches. So our Israel team is Israeli, right? The people that we have working inside Gaza, right? Palestinian, the people that are working in 
Ukraine are Ukrainian and Haiti, they're Haitians. So there's not much import stuff going on. Smart. And we grow all our food in Ukraine. So we pay farmers to grow it and package it and box it. So we so create jobs. So you're helping jobs. them be sustainable. That's yeah. so smart. Why isn't everybody doing that? Are you having an impact on other nonprofits that you can see, other organizations such as yours? I would similar? hope so. We, we, I think we support a lot of other nonprofits. I would, I would definitely not look at it in any way as like we're you know competing with them or anything. I think we provide a lot of of support. Right, we try to be an umbrella. Um, you know, in the UN, there's there's you know five major agencies: there's the Children Agency, you know UNHCR. Then there's the you know IOM, right, which is uh, mostly migration. Then there's UNHCR, um, refugees. And then there's a World Food Program food, right? So that's a that's a big block with you know twenty plus thirty plus billion dollars worth of you know funding that comes through. We try to be a more privatized, efficient version of that, right? That could probably do you know half of all that work for probably ten percent, ten cents on the dollar, right? It's the conversation between privatization and right big bureaucratic. Right, government, right? Sometimes five smart people could do more than a hundred uh, inefficient uh, people, and it's, it's about systems. Has Ukraine been the place you've had the greatest impact? You would say. I, I would say today, yeah, because of one partner that we have, you know, that's really, uh, you know, been incredible with us um, from the Buffett family, right? Uh, eldest son Howard, who really believes in Ukraine, right? Mm -hmm. So he gave us. An, an opportunity, right? It's it's all about money at the end, mm -hmm. right? That's, and we always learn the seed of money, right? In Kabbalah, right? It could be used as you know incredible things, right? And so the the value I have for money today is you know very different than before, right? And 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 there's people that I know today that that literally um, w will choose to give away a hundred million dollars a year rather than buying themselves a hundred million dollar yacht and actually live in a five bedroom house and give away a hundred million dollars a year mm -hmm. rather than living in a hundred million dollar house and giving away a million dollars a year, right? It's just a completely different, um, right? And what I think if you look at my Instagram, what I'm always, you know, trying to relate to others is the biggest lessons I've learned in Kabbalah is when I started, I was receiving, right, for myself. And now I've figured out somehow energetically to really receive only for the sake of sharing, right? If you look at, right, Jam, we, uh, $164 million last year, right? I think 3.7% was uh, corporate overhead, which is just basically, you know, salaries and rents and warehouses and stuff like that. Everything else went back to programs, right? Mm -hmm. It went straight back to people. So that's now utilizing your business skills because, you know, getting big grants like that, as you know, is the same as business, right? It's, you know, instead of, hey, can you hire my company to, you know, build your $30 million house so I can make a profit? It's, why don't you give me $30 million so I can build six schools and nine clinics, right, in your name and do that for you and help you with that, right? And that's what we do. And that's mm -hmm. that's like really the the, the, the key of, of like our fundraising platform. We don't really look for like blind gifts. I think that's where... You know, people have been hurt in the past with, you know, some of the big bureaucratic uh, organizations, right? You give money, it just disappears into the ethers. This is very tangible. This is, you know, this equals this, right? For $25,000, you can have a truck go from, you know, Cairo and straight into Gaza, and that aid will be distributed directly in the hands of people and not be given to Hamas and X, or for $20,000, you could send four containers from Miami to Israel after, you know, October 7th to help, right? Uh, the victims of October 7th in Israel. So when we worked with all the shuls and, you know, Shoal Bar Harbor and everybody in those things. So the unity is, you know, our strongest message. And again, I just, you know, I'm not just saying this because, you know, I'm on your podcast, like I owe it all, right, to the teachings, right? Uh, your father and yourself, your mother, and you know, all of you have, have brought because it that has been my you know uh, true inspiration, and it's been very difficult as I told you earlier to 
I speak to Kogat in Israel on a very friendly basis, probably three times a week. I'm probably- Sorry for our listeners, Kogat. Kogat is basically, you know, one of the branches under the Ministry of Defense for Israel, right? Uh, IDF, Kogat and all that. And they basically supervise the the territories, right? Like uh, like the Palestinian right, territory under Israel. And our our position, and it's been a very difficult position because I've been, you know, I've lost friends on, you know, both sides. Everyone wants you to take a side. Mm -hmm. You know, you must stand with us. You must stand with us. And, you know, our position has been, you know, we stand with suffering people and we, you know, cannot get into the political part of it. You just, we just can't. So our positive relationship, not attacking Israel in any way, not condemning them, not getting into anything has actually made us 10 times more uh, efficient inside Gaza. And, you know, sometimes Kogat will actually help facilitate uh, aid that's stuck at the border and hand it to us because we're a trusted partner, right? Because they know we're not going to give it, for example, to Hamas, right? Because we're not, you know, we're... And that neutrality, right, of just seeing all people as, as uh, you know, one united people and we're help. That's what our logo is in Global Empowerment Mission. I think it's, it's uh, you know, it's critical. And it, it allows, you know, in, in, in Haiti, when there was all the kidnappings, we were working with, you know, the, the diocese, basically, the, you know, the bishops, because they were the only ones that could get aid in without it getting hijacked right when there's a kentucky tornado in mayfield we have to work with the big churches the mega churches right the pastors and all that because they have all the volunteers and all the equipment and right and and all that and you know when there was surfside in miami we worked with you know the shoal of ball harbor right and mostly right the the jewish community and then we work with native tribes all throughout california that are you know uh, american indian uh, uh, tribes that we support, right? With water issues and everything. In Hawaii, we work with, right? Native Hawaiians. And if you start identifying yourself with only one type of group, right? You're going to be much less effective working with the whole world, right? You have to be able to wear whatever hat it is. It's so beautiful and, because yeah. we're not meant to judge or choose or you know, we're, we're meant to just be messengers and servants in that way. So as you've met all of these diverse people and different cultures and ethnicities, what is the one thing that has surprised you the most in terms of just human nature? And what is one thing that you see as absolutely universal among all the people that you've met? So you must have a very interesting, unique, beautiful perspective. Um, looking through that lens yeah. it's a very interesting lens and it's um it's very interesting to see what the reputation is of a country for example and then what it's actually really like right on the ground for example so let's take Assyria for example right in our eyes Syria is this you know nightmare you know whatever people think of it right but when I go into Syria, what I see is like beautiful, hungry children that are like so joyous because, right, we're just bringing them, you know, basic food that, you know, we would take for granted uh, like this. When I speak with many, many, many Muslims around the world and I ask them, how do you really feel about Jewish people? They tell me they're our cousins. Since the time of Abraham, we're the same family. What is this nonsense? This, this. So I hear that a lot, right? And then yes, there's good and bad people in all walks of life, and you will find bad Ukrainians, good Ukrainians. You'll find, you know, on mm -hmm. every side. And then there's those that hate. And that's want, human right? nature, yeah. but that's and, not right. It's, we assign it to be oh, those uh, people are like uh, that, but uh, we all have that within us. It's what you choose to grow and listen to. I've never met one like group of people. I mean, that, you know, <laughs> that are like you know <laughs> subpar that you know to all other groups of people. There's just bad apples. Maybe living in the blue zones. I yeah. don't know, but yeah. 
So in Ukraine, just to give our listeners a, a, a sense of the scope of your work, uh, if you had to quantify it in numbers in the past, you've been working in Ukraine in, for how long? Since the very beginning. So that's three years now, right? It's three two years? and a half years. Two and a half years. Yeah. Um, so what's what what uh, can you share as far as the scope, just in numbers and, and help? Yeah, the scope's pretty big. So our, our we have a giant warehouse that's about the size of a Costco, let's say a Target. Uh, that gets replenished about twice a month uh, with only uh, product that's uh, grown in Ukraine. I think last month in July, we sent uh, 327 full-size semi-trucks, like the 18-wheeler trucks, to the front lines. That's like between 10 kilometers and one kilometer of actual war. We service um, about 550,000 people a month that are in those frontline villages. With that would, food. Yeah, with food, food for the, yeah. We give them a box of food and supplies that they could survive on for two weeks. And then we replenish it every oh, two wow. weeks, yeah. So you're literally, I mean, it's a beautiful idea, yeah. right? That you and your organization are, are supporting 550,000 people a month. That's just- Just in, the food, in, right? In, in that, that, in that yeah, area. I mean, we distributed, right. I think, half a billion seeds so then they can grow um, food. And then we've replaced, uh, about 180,000 windows. So every time, you know, Russia blows up a building, the buildings that are across and across, they lose their windows, but nothing else. It just blows out from impact. If we didn't immediately come and replace those, especially during winter, they would have to basically pack up and leave or board themselves in the darkness and go into, you know, pretty bad, uh, you know, negative psychology that they have, you know, being in the dark like that. So we try to reverse a potential IDP crisis. IDPs internally displaced people, right? And internally displaced people lead to a refugee crisis, right? Mm -hmm. So first it helps Ukraine, secondary, it, it helps what would bleed into Poland. And then after Poland, it bleeds the rest of Europe. And after Europe, it bleeds right back into America. That's what's happened with Venezuela, with different countries. That's why we have these um, right situation. So people want to stay in where they're from. That's, you know, I mean, a typical Ukrainian does not want to leave. They're like, so yeah, it has a high impact. I mean, so how many windows did you say? How many? Uh, like 180,000, I think oh, you know, today we relocated like 40,000 people to 50 countries where we, you know, bought them plane tickets and relocated the ones that wanted to be relocated in the beginning. You know, it's high, it's high impact stuff. It's, uh, and it's incredible today, right? So, and, and this is my message for everybody who always, you know, contacts me and they're like, my life's falling apart. You know, I'm like, it's probably a good thing. It's probably because you're not doing the right thing with your life. Because can you imagine me doing this type of work and I have a woman calling me that I'm building a house for right now and she's yelling at me because her kitchen cabinets aren't being installed on time or you know the refrigerator hasn't, can you imagine my attention span, right? Or I, I have to leave Ukraine right now because I have to be at the club and shake hands with a bunch of people, you know, because there's an important party. It didn't work, right? It was out of Right? Alignment and out of alignment. The so is the universe cut it out for me, right? <laughs> and I remember this one ceremony when all three beach clubs went out in in one hurricane. I was like, "How can you do this to me? You're not going to do this in your life." And that was my message. And if you don't believe it, try to open up another beach club and watch what happens, Michael. That was like the message, loud and clear. I was like, okay, "And you did? God. Oh, you did? No, I didn't. No. I got the message. Yeah." It's so interesting because if you, you look at your life today and what you're doing, it, like you just said, imagine, forget about doing both kind of, what if you had just like not heard the message and you just continued, you know, yeah, your cabinets are coming and, and building these things, like the, the potential that was within you. And it's something we teach often that's within all of us. We underestimate how powerful we are, what a difference we can make. And we don't have that vision or can't see it or don't believe in ourselves enough. But imagine it, it's a wasted life You're, if you had lived that other life. And, and such an important message is that, you know, there's a story, there's a, which is longer than this, which I won't tell, but I do often tell, but 
if you, when and if you ever have to leave this physical world and you come up to the heavens, the creator is going to say, would have said, what happened to the millions and millions and millions of people you were supposed to help? help? And you'd be dumbfounded. Like black people. I was a very successful, you know, construction, you know, company owner, you know, nightclub over at my kids to school. You know, I did really well. I helped a few yeah. hundred people here, but I gave a few donations here and there. But what are you talking about? You'd be dumbfounded to think. Yeah, you could say, yeah, I shared, but to the level of what you were supposed to do, right? We don't see that. We don't see it until the end really yeah. but yeah yeah you got to see it early <laughs> well yeah i was like i said that's that's why i didn't feel like we could have this conversation without me bringing up you know the sneak peeks i've had right through through those certain things but um i'm forever grateful uh for it and um you know just the the understanding and the lessons that i've gotten from the center like i said it's 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 everything and um no yeah. I was going to say uh, to our listeners, right, that every one of our listeners has a lot more people that their soul came to help than they're currently doing all, I mean, you know, all of us included, but, and I think it's, for me, what's, what's inspiring about your story is to really open up that thought process, right? You know, we're all good people, we're all spiritual, we're all trying to do good, but expand how, ex how much you actually expect of yourself to do in this world, because again, just per, just to your story, you, had you not taken this turn, right, there'd be millions of souls complaining about you. You know, Michael was supposed to help us, and, uh, and he was a nice guy and all, but he didn't, he didn't show up. And they'd be sitting on the bench in judgment, all the ones yeah. that, you know, got, you know, whatever, had too many drinks from the nightclub, <laughs> because he drunk, and, you know, also. all of, you know, uh, all of that yeah and so i wanted to ask also a little bit about your work in in gaza when you started and what you've done there and a little bit of your experiences there yeah so you you went so october 7th that you as you were sharing. yeah so october 7th happened we immediately um you know helped israel um and what and, was that maybe some details on that. um basically a few of our uh jewish executive board members uh rallied up uh, different uh, shoals and synagogues in South Florida. I think we worked with like seven or eight of them and they all collected supplies through the community. And uh, because we have a big warehouse in Miami and all that, right? We took in all those supplies and um, we did some air shipments and uh, containers, right? So that was the, the first uh, part of what we did. Then obviously we knew that you know, this was gonna you know, kind of flip and also be a situation on the other side, which is very rare, right? Uh, it's not, um, you know, so it's, it, it's a very difficult uh, situation for me. And as soon as I um, went to Egypt to try to figure out how to get aid for Palestinians, many of my best friends that are Jewish blocked me and never wanted to speak to really? me really yeah and i became you know like, this, like yeah. yeah and you know it hurt me a lot and as something really? you know to this close day, friends I, you would say close yeah friends? close yeah some of my like best friends mm. and i don't remember ever criticizing israel one single time like i really did my best to stay you know out of it and just basically get aid to people and everybody kept telling me, all you're gonna do is get your aid stolen and you're gonna help Hamas and you shouldn't be helping them and you should be only helping Israel. And you know, my instructions are clear from above. <laughs> I speak to angels daily and you are not taking sides and you are helping everybody and that is your job, end of story. And I believe we, you know, figured out a way that, um, you know, we have just different systems. So there's a lot of agencies that uh, just basically care only about stats. So they just send a whole bunch of trucks. But when those trucks arrive, if they just drop that off at some random shelter or some you know auditorium somewhere, they get to say they dropped nine trucks off for the day. You have no idea where that aid is coming. So we make it more difficult, more expensive, more staff is required, you know, and we set up basically uh, a warehouse inside Khan Yunus with our own staff and our own controls. And then that aid goes from Cairo to there. And then from there, basically we hand deliver to people that are already vetted that we have their names and a list. I mean, you can see the little tickets on our website and everything. They have to pass a whole vetting system to email 
be able to receive a box of food. Mm. And the way we do it, that stuff, you can't really sell it. It's just a, a survival kit for the week, right? Um, so I do not feel in any way that that would assist in any way uh, Hamas, support terrorism in any way. I think it's, we are just helping uh, people. And before, How many people a week are you providing? Well, lately it's been very, very it's difficult. There was a time when I think on the uh, OCHA, which was one of the agencies for UN, I think in June, we were like the fourth largest uh, producer of food inside Gaza. You produce food in no, Gaza? No, not like, oh, like uh, you know, right. yeah. yeah. Yeah, like we rank number four in the- And how many people in the cluster? That would be like World Food Program number one. And then that would be like uh, UAE. Um, um, yeah, like, um, you know, Dubai, uh, you know, that major money. And then we were like number, Egyptian how Red many, Cross. How many people were you feeding? Uh, 200,000 or wow. something like that. Beautiful. Right. Beautiful. Um, but and you that, went, you were sharing before that you what you yourself went to Rafa. I went because I, first I always go, but I really wanted to see, you know, what yeah. this was all about, right? And this I is in January? Yeah, this is in January. And I know it's a t touchy subject for many people, um, but I wanted to meet them myself. And um, when I presented myself publicly to them, um, to the Palestinians, by the way, um, I purposely went in disguise. So I didn't wear any gem clothes uh -huh. and I didn't show up with gifts or aid or anything. I wanted to spend a day just meeting people. Well, who'd you say you were? What? Who, who, just, I was just walking through the tent cities. Uh -huh. Just, uh, sorry, just practical because I'm, I'm, I'm interested. You got from Cairo to Rafa by private car? Car, yeah. Was, was security services involved or? It was like a security and a driver. Yeah, it was, you know. And you all, come to the Rafa crossing and this is in January. Was yeah, I mean, you had to be on the like, list. Hi, to, my, to, oh, you to, did. Okay, yeah, so yeah. You had... Oh, yeah, yeah. It's super complicated. There's like 18 borders or something. Right. 18. Yeah, <laughs> just like, to get to But once you get into Rafa, are, do you have security with you? Once I got to Rafa, I was received by our partners that have been operating inside uh, Gaza for, you know, 20, 30 years or okay. something, right? So they received me. And then um, I told you, I, it was already nighttime by the time I got in. I just started walking around at night. I was extremely surprised. I was Were you it. scared? I will be spoken before you, know, you don't no, really feel fear. Yeah, really. No, I wasn't scared. And what I saw is in videos all over my Instagram, Mr. Mr. Come, come. And they would bring me in their tent and, you know, they would make me tea. And then I would, you know, have a translator, of course. And, you know, I would ask them questions. And I asked a lot of questions like a reporter. And I think the one question that I continually asked is, what do you really think of Jewish people? That's and a, I did not hear what I see on the news at all. I heard more love and cousins, and I heard we don't like the government, we don't like what they've done to us, but the people we have no issue with. We wanna live in peace. That's beautiful. I mean, it's yeah. It's just a lot of people won't swallow that pill. That you tell them that they're they'll block you. So how many days were you in Rafa then in January? Five. Five days, and then you decide. I mean, the point was to decide whether it's. it's so after that, I hired a whole bunch of people in it, locals. and now we have locals. Now we have about thirty people that work for us, and now we have zooms with some of those people almost every single day. So now I hear play by play everything. Like I can tell you what you know area is being evacuated right now outside of Khan Yunus and Dair Bien. Like you know, so now I really understand everything. So maybe share with us your call today or yesterday. What, what were your local work representatives? This is probably the most difficult time uh, ever inside of that uh, area right now. Can you specifically or? Yeah, so what's happened is, and, th and this happens in many countries, it's also happened in uh, you know Sudan lately. There's another branch other than Hamas that has formed of like under Lord kind of criminals. Uh -huh. Right, they've taken advantage. Right, like in uh, right, that's what happens when there's right. no order. Right. right, and they are now basically let, let's just call them the the mafia. Right, um, and they are the ones that are now looting and stealing trucks. So now, for the first time, we've had uh, you know 
a truck driver comes. Your trucks. Our, our trucks oh, wow. show up. We have, you know, 300 tents in them. All of a sudden, our guys are surrounded by 20 armed militants, but they're not Hamas. They're like gangsters. Oh, wow. And they'll check the truck. They'll, you know, put guns on the Palestinian head. Really? And, yeah. But then when they see that it's tense, they'll put the driver back and let him go. But what, what they're looking, they what what they're yeah, looking what they? for is things they could sell. They're looking for big bags of rice, big bags of flour. They're looking for cigarettes. They're looking for things they could sell on the black market. You can't sell tents on the black market, right? So it's not like a commodity that they want to steal. But that, I mean, you could read about it in a lot of, you know, big stories right now in New York Times and stuff. So about, that's like the, the... The stealing part, we say... The, yeah, so the stealing yeah. part is is so... Uh, bad right now that it's it the the risk level right there was a time i think in july where 85 percent of all aid that was coming in was being looted wow right and it was yeah yeah we've only had like a i think a three percent in all our time working there of uh basically losses right of like what we've got three percent that's yeah, very low yeah. And that's because we're locals. And I believe that when locals are driving local trucks and they know everybody, it's a whole different right. story than, you know, the big outsider. And they haven't gotten uh, scared splash. off, say, I'm not going to drive the truck anymore. Um, I don't know. They work for a company, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I mean, they need work, I'm sure. Too. Yeah, but still. the prices have gone up. Oh, the prices for you yeah, to be able yeah. to bring in yeah. food. and Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But, you know. We, we didn't only help with, with October 7th. We've been, you know, supporting Israel the entire time. Um, the recent, uh, you know, uh, killings of the children. In the, shops, yeah. yeah, in the, you know, the soccer field and all that. You can look on our, you know, page or Instagram. You know, we gave all those families uh, basically money of those children, right? Just so they have a little bit of, of short-term incidental. And, you know, there's been a lot of people don't know this, um, people in Israel know this, but a lot of people don't realize that, you know, how many people are living in bunkers in Northern Israel right now. I mean, it's beyond. And uh, we've been bringing mattresses that we got from Miami, for example, large scale, like plane loads of rolled up mattresses and bringing them to Northern Israel for basically people that are in those, you know, bunker shelters that, you know, really can't evacuate. I mean, the hotel rooms are full, as you know, because of the the situation, right? So it, it's a lot. And then we were also in, in Lebanon just recently, just really? to like, yeah, have you, see- Have you gone? Are you planning No, on? not myself, but okay. you know, we, we sent teams out there. We wanted to see, you know, kind of what the temperature was there and, and, and everything, so- You think you should do work in Lebanon, is that? Well, we have to help, you know, people. Right. Um, you know, we pray every day that there'll be some kind of proper resolution to all of this and, you know, tricky very very you know it's a very difficult situation and and i think you know i'm really able to like i understand all the different viewpoints and sides you know and and if a palestinian that you know hates a jewish person because of this situation happened to be in israel on october 7th and his family got hit you know he'd be looking at it through their lenses right it's like they just don't understand and you know and if many people in israel were inside you know gaza when a rocket is you know accidentally whatever you know hurting somebody and they knew that family they would also have compassion but you've got to see it like macro you've got to be able to like look at it as you know as angels see the whole big picture to really um and see it but um i will say that um from the people that my team speak to and remember they're from there and we have people in egypt also who are palestinian that work in our egyptian branch that are big locals from there um they can't stand hamas and they want them out and gone they just is that a consensus you would they're say? not going to say this publicly they cannot say this publicly and yes there's always you know a few that you know after their whole family you know something happened to them obviously they they're vengeful sure. but um they all know that life was better before the, you know they sure. did this stupid thing for for them there so and do you so you, are you planning to increase your activity in gaza or can you at this time or is it 
we can't at this time. Not right, right. I mean, with the right now, where in. our warehouses and con units and where our staff apartments are, it's in a, a we're deconflicted by Kogat, right? So they know where we are. So we haven't had any incidents, but it's becoming an evacuation zone. Oh, did. Yeah, yeah. The problem is the tunnels. Everything is right. all the all of this is because of the tunnels. Because you know, you take out the north and they move to the south. Then right. you take out the south, you move them to the middle. Now they're in the middle, you know, and you move them back where they're going to keep going in the tunnels and going where they need to go. Wow. So you think you would have to, to reduce some of the activity right now while um potentially yeah. potentially this is a you know this is a really a really bad time and it's a very bad time not just for you know gaza for for israel i mean it's you know it's it's, it's on the verge of, of things but i do hear um that there's you know a deal being made right now to you know with yeah, I don't know if I can talk too much about it, but not just the the hostage deal, but a, like a a big master plan deal with um, potential new management in that area, right. not Hamas. And right. so. hopefully, I, should, I want to touch one more point, which you mentioned, which I, th I thought was interesting. That you said you lost some close friends, and and for me, that's that that topic of we'll call it loyalty. Yeah, so, when you said you got hurt, I think you piqued both of our. Yeah, interest. because that's because it's it's an interesting thing in human nature, right? You know, my father would always say, when somebody's your friend, he should remain a friend forever. What's a friend a friend for life. Yeah. And, um, and that that's state not of always human nature. can change, and it can be a different friendship, but that means that even if you don't speak to somebody for 20 years, but they were somebody significant in your life, you'd still show up for them in some capacity yeah. and not write them so, off. So, yeah, so what has been, so maybe just to your emotional experience, you said some close friends who, who yeah, just- Yeah, I would say almost best friends. Best friends. Um, Because I've been through so much, I understand trauma probably a little bit better than most people. And this generational trauma with all the triggers that October 7th caused, whatever they're feeling and the, 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 the vengefulness that they have and all these things, in my book, they're already forgiven. It's not their fault. It's like, you know, it's just over and over again. And it's, you know, it's very hard, right? So these emotions that, that, that are coming out, I think they may look back at it one day, you know, and like, uh, I was a little overreactive, right? But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's painful, you know, it's very painful. And I have a lot of, you know, also Jewish friends, you know, and especially at the center, um, you know, that really respect what we do um and uh that are for it but again it's tricky have you reached out to those friends that you've uh, blocked oh you're blocked there's no there's yeah no i was like <laughs> i think that's the hardest part i mean i think most of us have had those experiences um i had a best friend of 20 years and one day she decided she wouldn't be friends anymore for whatever reason but it feels like a death because when a person just decides and then they kind of write you off and you're out of there and they don't give you the chance, it feels like that person's, no, they're, it, they're dead and you want to have some kind of closure or just understand it. But, you know, in my case, in the end, I realized why she was removed from my life and um, it was actually the best thing. All that energy I gave her, I was supposed to put somewhere else. It became super clear and I wasn't willing to let go of that friendship. And I'm not saying it's the same in your situation, but whatever reason they're not meant to be here right now i agree with you it's part of the same type of alignment right mm -hmm. like you you know you, you you you're either on the side of you know let's make the world a harmonious right unified place where there's no colors and religions and you know and 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 uh and we're all one you're either you know on that trajectory or you're in the old school trajectory which is going to cause you know in the last six thousand years of warfare and you know uh, and that and um I I actually genuinely believe there could be big peace in the world and 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 unity. I see it every day. You I just need know. the right leaders to be able to like put people together. Not, not very many good leaders these days. <laughs> well, we need to grow the children to become great leaders. Yeah. Um, you, so I have a question? few rapid fire questions for you. Okay. Let's see. What is your favorite word? My favorite word. Mm -hmm. 
That's a good question, Charlie. What my favorite word is. You tell me later what my favorite Just think. Is. Probably harmony or alignment or, you know, empower. We were cut back to something, you know, we were talking about you and I uh, when I first got here, right? So there's a, I studied Kundalini yoga and, uh, you know, the person that like made that famous, right? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's from the Sikhs. Right, but you know it's the same thing. So um, there was Guru Nanak, right? The equivalent of of um, like your father, right? And then um, Yogi Bhajan. And Yogi Bhajan uh, always talks about uh, the lighthouse, right? So how to get to the golden age, right? In, in from the Eastern way, how can you actually like go through all the yugas and get to a golden age? Well, the only way you can get to it is if you have one lighthouse. Let's call it light of the Rav who creates three lights. And now you have you guys, which created all the lights of the Kabbalah Center, which Michael Caboni is now a student of. So he becomes a lighthouse. And then now all of the gem people are basically getting some of that light. And then all of the workers, a gem, the ones in Ukraine, the ones here and here are now spreading, right? That light. And all of a sudden you have a giant pocket of light, right? And you fast forward through the ages, right? And there's more light than darkness, right? That's like the, the, the gist of it. But all of the lessons that I learn, even through the complicated ones in the Zohar, I'm able to sometimes, you know, in just three seconds, meet someone that's just gone through this, you know, horrendous situation. Uh, or losing a daughter, it could be the most horrible things. And for somehow I'm able to like uplift them, you know, and, and there's nothing that God can do today that I don't fully understand. Like I, I understand it all. Mm -hmm. I understand it all. I remember, you know, in Surfside when it happened, I met this, you know, beautiful Orthodox woman and she kept coming. We had a booth there and we were helping people and she kept coming every day. And she's like, they're going to find my daughter. I know it. She's in that rubble. They're going to find her. And I would talk to her. And she's like, all our lives, we did everything right. Everything right. God would never do this to me. And I was like, and then eventually she was told, um, you know, your daughter was found, you know, in the rubble and she's dead. And she told me she had been kosher her whole life, you know, studied her whole life, everything. And she could not understand why God would do that to her. And she was about to lose her faith. She was literally like, I don't even know what to believe anymore. And I was like, what if your incredible daughter that did everything right, earned her passage. And what if you haven't yet? And what if you're being tested right now for this? You know, you must trust, try to communicate with your daughter. Now, try to communicate, she's not gone. You just can't see her. Two caterpillars, one patched first, you can't see the butterfly. Don't be upset. There's no such thing as death. And You know, I, I just feel that, you know, she got it eventually, you know, and it's, you know, that's probably the hardest thing, right? That anyone on the, on, on the planet can go through. And there was another person, uh, Steve Rosenthal, him, I could say his name. And he was a guy that lived in Surfside. And uh, when he heard the shake, he opened his door, looked out. And all his neighbors were gone and his front door of his hallway was basically the cliff. And uh, he went back to his balcony and the fire department came and basically put out like a, a big basket and got him out and he survived. And then I was with him, you know, every day helping him in, in every way that I could. And Steve had been a guy that uh, his father was a rabbi and he was Jewish and he had been lost in like the nightlife world like I had for years, right? Basically, you know, the South Beach guy, you know, rich guy in Miami, you know, he's like 70 years old now, you know, still doing that. 
<sighs> and, you know, he would sit with me and he'd be like, Michael, I just, I, why did God choose me and all those beautiful, nice people that were so friendly every time I was in the elevator with them, they would greet me and, and pray and, you know, open the door for me. Why did they die? And why did I, why, why, why did I make it? You know, I was like, let me ask you something, Steve. I go, you think your father sees you? Your father was a rabbi, right? He goes, yeah. I go, what do you think he thinks of your lifestyle right now? He's a rabbi, right? He's like, whoa, nobody's ever talked to me like that before. I go, no, seriously. What do you think your father, the rabbi, and the angels in the higher world, looking down at you with your bottles of champagne and liquor for the last 50 years, are thinking? He's like, wow. I go, maybe this is your opportunity to basically get a second chance to basically shift. So then when they found the contents of the stuff in the rubble, they found his, what's it called? The free, Ellie. Yeah, from, 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 a, yeah from, a, from his bar mitzvah. And he called me, he's like, you'll never believe it. They didn't find anything from my crushed wow. apartment, but that. He's like, that's a sign. He's like, you're onto something. <laughs> he's like, I think you're right. He's like, I think I'm going to make some changes. Wow. Steven wakes up every single day now and goes to temple and reads. <laughs> and he's back in like where he's in a like sound place, right? So that experience, right, for him, right, was an opportunity to probably save himself for reincarnation, right? right? <laughs> like, so it's definitely such beautiful stories. Right. So these are all the things that that's why I say that, that I've learned through the center that I get to teach every single person, right, that I meet. It's a different thing that you want right. to tell them, right? And it's uh, it's beautiful. So that's the light, right? So right. now now he's in the light. He's out of the darkness. Now he's telling other people that. And there's the... So lighthouse is your favorite word, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> that was beautiful. Uh, what is the word that you hate hearing or you dislike hearing? I think segregation, you know, uh, we are better, they're bad. I just, it's just really sad. And um, like all of us, we just got to fast forward more towards a unified world. If you could have dinner with any historical figure, who would it be and why? With any historical figure. Hmm. I Abraham Christ. <laughs> the why is obvious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what quality are you most impressed in by others and other people? The light in their eyes, you can tell right away, you know, the light, like you guys radiate light, you yeah. see it, you know, it's glowing. And I think, uh, you know, it's infectious, right? And um, yeah, it's what I try to like look for in, in people. Because um, if they have that, then they're, you know, all you have to do is like, like it happened with me, show them their full potential, right? And it could be so much more. And, you know, we didn't get into that. All our leaders at GEM, all of them, are actual victims mm -hmm. who had no experience whatsoever in this sector. And now they are the director leading, you know, armies of humanitarian workers. And it came from, mm -hmm. right, them being in the tragedy and me little, guiding them step by step. Our director in Ukraine, for example, studies Kabbalah. I got him with a Kabbalah teacher. We've been to, you know, many, uh, you know, uh, tombs and, you know, important sites in uh, Ukraine, right? He reads the Zohar. It's it's incredible, Amazing. right? It's yeah. so smart. What's his name? Uh, Andre. Because you can't teach people empathy, right? And compassion. 
and relatability, but you found people who have that and then you teach them skills. It's beautiful. Yeah. You know, we put Zohars in those boxes sometimes. Too. I was going oh, to wow. ask you, but I, yeah. I didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Tens of thousands. Yeah. Love that. Yeah, all the time. I always have one on me. Sometimes I'll give it to the right person, the one I have in my pocket. But yeah. And it's not from a, you know, and I always say, this has nothing to do. We're not trying to convert you or preach thing. This is a, a book to protect you. I can honestly say that I have sat with probably more than 10 governors inside Ukraine and in their, you know, governor's mansion, I'll bring them a big black Zohar. And I'll say, this is a gift. They give me a bunch of gifts for what we're doing. And I give them this gift. I say, just put it on your shelf. You don't have to read it. This will protect you. Just consider like an invisible layer of protection. You're going to need it. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful. Really beautiful. Anyway, last question. When was the last time you laughed? I just laughed. <laughs> no, but like, you a know, hard laugh, like yeah, hearty and maybe some tears. Yeah, not that much lately. It's definitely something I can, you know, work on. I know the Dalai Lama is really good at that about, you know, that kind of uh, joy and stuff, but it's tough. It's a tough life. Which actually, that's a good question. I, mean, I was going to ask yeah. when was the last time you cried. And I was like, no, I don't want to ask that. I want to ask when was the last time you laughed. And I guess that's why more. But do you find it, it's, it did you find it? difficult to be in a state of happiness? Finding it. I think this this particular year has been a little bit, you know, trying to get a little bit more balance, but it's, it's a very tough life. I mean, I, I can honestly say that I wake up at 7 and 6, 30, 7 a.m. every day, and I probably don't stop working till midnight or 1 a.m. I'll be lucky if I can get sometimes on a weekend or, you know, one day out of a weekend or something. Um, it's just so much responsibility and you have so many branches around the world and you're dealing with so many time zones, right? So by the time I want to go to sleep tonight, Hawaii is asking me for approvals on invoices and whatever it is, right? Because they're getting up and, and, and by the time I wake up, Ukraine is already in full force. You could wake up that morning to there was an explosion, right? So you're like a 24 hour fire station right. globally at the head of it all. A huge responsibility, right? So, do you do you feel you have? I mean, it doesn't sound, it sound like, like it, it, right? That you have balance, or that you're trying to go towards balance, right? Because if we're looking for the long term, right, usually balance and what will sustain you for the next fifty years, right? Yeah, it's definitely something that I I need to to work on better. Today, you know, when you're the head of that big of a private emergency department, I couldn't even imagine what would happen if you know I went to, you know some beautiful spiritual retreat for three days, turned off my phone. I turned it back on three days and I heard that, you know, people got killed and this and that. And I was like in my, you know, presence. Um, <laughs> it's, it, it's tough, right? It's, uh, it's just like the Israeli soldiers right now, right? That are usually exercising Shabbat right now. They're not. Right. Right? I can call the guy, the head of Kogat right now during Shabbat. He's going to pick up the phone right. because they're in it. Yeah, it's true. So thank you so much, Michael. I, I know, like I said, for me, there's, I think for our listeners, there's a, lo a lot of inspiration here, but probably the most important one is this idea that each one of us can and should be doing more, right? It's funny when you, when you ask Michael what, what his favorite word is, my, I wanted to ask what yours is, mine is potential. And I think that's probably humanity's biggest problem is that none of us, most of us, don't really appreciate the potential that we have to make our world a better place. And if more people are awakened to that, for sure, we're going to see tremendous changes. So again, like I said, you're, you're literally helping millions and millions of people every single day. And you didn't know you had that potential until life brought you there, forced you there. So I find your story very inspirational, hopefully for our listeners as well. Yeah, very, you are very inspiring. And I feel, um, I feel your imprint just from spending this hour with you, really. Yeah. I'm forever grateful, you know, to your entire family. Because like I said, I might not be born Jewish, but I it, it I registered it all. I got it, you know. I listened very carefully and you know, I probably did eight straight years of, you know, going to the center every Saturday, hearing every Shabbat lesson 
taught by the teachers, being on, you know, the altar, they've let me hold the Torah, you know, 50 times, you know, I've connected and that energy, it, that it's it. It just like, ring, you know? Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.